Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, do we have any new faces tonight? Don't think so. Uh, uh, tonight we've got two talks. Uh, we've got Sean talking about OWeb, uh, which is a really cool sort of full stack ML web framework. Uh, and we have Mitchell talking about his exact arithmetic in Haskell. Uh, but first, uh, if anybody needs it, bathroom is downstairs. We'll meet uh, for pizza at about 6.45. Uh, and thanks, Sean. I think that's it. Um, but you've probably had enough time to read the first slide, so we'll yeah. just get rolling. Um, the OWeb language, or OWeb framework, uh, was created by Adam Chipalia. Um, he's done many other terrifying and awesome things with respect to types and type theory. Um, OWeb itself is based on the uh, language, um, which has a lot of things going for it. Um, we'll just cover off what we're going to do tonight. We'll just have a brief discussion of the R language and the benefits it brings to OWeb, the compiler and libraries built on top. Um, have a look at the different things that are built in, so HTML, SQL, um, the complete lack of JavaScript, which is great. Um, and then a bit about the type system itself, and then just on some of the things that OWeb can't do, or OWeb isn't very good at. Um, so R itself is kind of a descendant or cousin of Haskell and ML. Um, so it's pure, statically typed. Um, unlike Haskell, it's actually strict, so there's eager evaluation. Um, so no tricks with infinite lists or anything like that. Um, however, it also has uh, type level programming, uh, anonymous records, and row types. And it also decided to steal type classes uh, from Haskell. So there's a hell of a lot in the base language. And unfortunately, Ur itself cannot be used outside of Ur web. Um, it was sort of built as the first piece um, and partially proven in Coq as well for soundness. For those that are interested in such things. Um, so OWeb is primarily a special standard library um, and a purpose-built compiler for building essentially database-backed web apps. Um, and it's all, as it says, all designed so that well-typed OWeb programs just don't go wrong. So it's a nice big list of all the things that will not happen inside an OWeb application. Um, so you can't have code injection attacks because of a couple of reasons with respect to the tokenization of forms. Um, you also have to bless or allow explicitly any URLs in your application. Um, that works for patents as well, just to save a bit of time. You can't return invalid HTML, uh, which I'll get into later. Um, all the intra-application links, so anything inside your application is essentially just a function. So if you've done something wrong, nothing will compile. Um, and there's all sorts of other fun things which you can do. Um, and also, the good, another good one is the inval no invalid SQL queries, uh, because they're checked by the compiler for type safety and soundness. Um, so we'll start off with the XML, or just the HTML. It's built into the language. Um, so all of the different tags for XML, HTML, um, they're just functions in the language. Um, and the compiler has special phases which actually check that the structure you've given it is of the correct form. So just have a bit of a look. So this is actual OWeb code, so this would appear inside your source files. Um, it's an XML body. See, we've got a dodgy tag. That's a compiler error because we haven't closed the tag off. Um, and also, you can't do things like having a form within a form. Um, that's actually a compiler error as well. There's an explicit technique for creating subforms. Um, so that will actually be a compiler error as well. Um, in addition to this, the uh, SQL is actually baked into the language as well. Um, so you type your queries in line, um, not encapsulated in strings or using um, different data structures or something like that. Uh, Postgres supported by default, um, primarily because of the use of transactions, um, which I'll touch on a bit later. Um, but again, just like the XML, the SQL is just made up of functions. Um, and you create records for the database tables, and so everything can be checked. 
So just a simple example, you can create a table with the types, and they're all set your primary key, and then you just run, you can type, just an example query, and there's no quoting or anything like that, so that's all just functions and checked in the language. Um, and then in this case, it's just select everything from there and then run this function to produce some XML for every row in the, that's produced from the query. And that's just a little bit of the interpolation. Um, just some of the things that won't work. So we'll catch some basic type errors. We try and check for um, an ID or buzz, which is a string. And you're actually meant to be looking for an int type failure, uh, compile failure. Um, and again, when you're selecting from trying to select something that doesn't actually exist in that table, will be a compile error as well. Um, so just a bit on the front end, everything in OWEB is basically written in OWEB. Uh, there's no need to call out to external JavaScript libraries unless you need some special functionality. Um, so the OWEB compiler during a couple of its phases actually works out which code needs to be compiled for the front end and which is to be kept for the back end um, and separates it out accordingly. Um, the so it produces all of the JavaScript you need for the front end. Um, it, the JavaScript, the sorry, the front end also has support for functional reactive programming using signals, um, and the communication with the back end is usually via RPC or typed channels, uh, similar to uh, CSP channels. Um, so if you've got just some dynamic HTML, which is going to change based on some functionality, you'll just read off a particular signal which you created earlier and then do something amazing and you can either replace out this um, HTML dynamically in the page or do something else entirely. Um, and there's also all of the all of our old favorites like the on click, on key down, on change, all the rest of it, they're all in there as well. Um, the compiler itself actually produces a single executable, um, so there's no need to create a separate web server or pick a particular library for running the HTTP requests or anything. You just get a single exe, um, or executable binary, I guess. Um, it compiles down to C code using the MLTON whole, pr whole program compiler, um, which does crazy things with inlining and Monomorphizing, monomorphizing functions and things like that. Um, it has no garbage collection in the back end. Um, so all of the memory memory requirements for each of the different handler requests and things like that, they use uh, region-based memory management, which sort of allocates a chunk, an expected chunk of memory for the handler based on a uh, static analysis. And then it will attempt to complete the request if it finds it can't. It goes, it rolls back the rolls back the request, allocates more memory, and then tries again. Um, and then it will know for next time how much memory to allocate for particular requests, and then we'll just keep going from there. Um, and portions of it, as Adam describes, are stupid fast. Um, it's for some of the tech power benchmarks for processing and response times. It's uh, second or third against C frameworks, GoLang. Um, Haskell, obviously PHP, um, and quite a few others. Um, for some of the benchmarks it doesn't do so well uh, because of the transaction system that it uses. Um, and so I keep talking about transactions, but get into it. A transaction is, in the language, it's similar to I.O. in Haskell. So all things that were going to affect the outside world or the terrifying mutable state ball that is the HTML on the front end um, will run inside of a transaction. Um, it has support, uh, web and er uh, has support for monads and we get similar do notation syntax which you may be familiar with. Um, but it's worth pointing out that everything is inside a transaction, every single, so when you get a request um, that entire request is going to be inside a transaction from the DB call to any changes that are done on the front end 
um, the whole thing is wrapped up in a transaction. Um, this causes it to be extremely robust in terms of making sure bad things don't happen to HTML or the data in the database, things like that. Um, the slight penalty is that it is slower because it has to get to the end of, it has to ensure everything can complete successfully before it will commit. So it means no database changes, no front end updates until it's sure that everything's going to be successful, um, which is good and bad. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Just kind of steamrollering through this. <laughs> Um, so just go have a little bit of a talk about the type system. Um, the type system is largely drawn from ML. Um, so coming from a Haskell background, there's a lot of things which are strange, awesome, and infuriating. Um, primarily, uh, there's no FMAP, which is really kind of sad, but it's almost there. Um, so it has type inference similar to what we have in Haskell and a few other languages. Um, again, parametric polymorphism, so we can get a little ID function. Um, the variable in the square brackets is our type parameter, and then we're saying the function is takes an X of type A and returns an A, so we just return the X. Um, it does have higher order functions as well. Um, so this is the signature for the MIP function. Uh, MAP is a reserved keyword for the type level programming. So we get MP um, for value level programming. Um, the triple colon uh, is a type parameter that you have to pass in when you call the function, or if you're defining functions that operate and use this particular function. Um, the type system underneath um, OWEP uses first class or impredicative uh, polymorphism. Um, and there's lots of situations in OWEP where the type checking can actually be undecidable. So there's a lot of, you often have to provide uh, quite a lot of annotation to some functions. Um, but usually only when, only when you're actually implementing them, the use of the functions tends to be pretty straightforward. You specify point A to point B, if the compiler's having any trouble, and then it's usually fine from there. Um, and polymorphic data types, similar to what we've got in Haskell, so that's just the list of A. Um, the difference, a big difference is the uh, recursive constructor on the right-hand side. The star indicates that this is uh, basically going to create a tuple of A and then a list of A. So when you're constructing it, uh, this kind of uh, recursive data type, you'll end up having cons, which are constructor, and then a tuple of the value, and then the rest of the list. And then all the way down to, you can see down the end, cons one, you know, so it's just a tuple. It has anonymous records as well, um, which are really useful. You can just spin them up as a value if you require something, just a temporary record to hold values or you don't need it outside of a function. Um, or you can declare them as types and give them all of the different types that you need. Um, and this is one of the infuriating points coming from Haskell, is you'll notice that the field names are uppercase and their types are lowercase. <laughs> Many a type error. And then you've got the ability to access the properties of a record just using uh, dot syntax. And then that is okay, uh, that handles nesting as well. So if you've got records within records, you don't immediately wish for lens because you can just use the dot syntax to travel down the tree. Uh, one of the bits that stole from Haskell um, is actually type classes. Uh, so in this case, we've just got our max function for some A, and it includes an explicit, uh, what they call a witness value, for that A is orderable. Um, in this function, you don't have to 
include, like, it's nice and simple, you don't need to include or worry about that value. You can just put in an underscore there, and that's to compile clever enough to work it out. Um, but the type classes can be complex and difficult to implement because of the um, high kinded polymorphism that happens in our web. It's quite different to Haskell, so it takes a bit of getting used to. Uh, but when you get things working, it's just as nice. Um, as an example of the first one, they, one person was working on their OWEB project and they had one error in a 300 line OWEB file and they had 2.4 meg worth of type error output. <laughs> um, the, even the simple type errors can be relatively terrifying in OWEB. Um, it's not immediately obvious what's going on. Um, it because primarily because it gives you the entire abstract syntax tree of the location around where the error occurred. So if you get the error inside of your HTML, you're going to get the entire possible record for that function um, for the HTML component printed out. And because each one will have a default value for all of the possible handlers for that piece of HTML, plus any other function that could be attached, plus everything else you've done, um, having probably 50 or 70 line type errors is not uncommon. So it makes it slightly hard to deal with. Uh, there is a Google Summer of Code project to improve the type errors, um, but we wait with major breath for that. Uh, the first class in, in predicative polymorphism uh, seems to be extremely powerful. Um, I'm still learning the type system, and there's a lot to it. Um, so for, at the moment, to me, it just looks really complex. Um, but it does give a lot of capability. There is possible to, to define a functor, which is an ML functor, not Haskell functor, um, which, when given a database table, will create a web page for administering that entire table. So adding, removing, updating, checking all of the records, and that's just a you give it the database table and then it goes from there. Um, the functors that exist are, as I said, the ML style functors. So they go from module to module, um, not operating on a value within a particular context, like we might be used to from Haskell. Um, and there are some problems with this. The MP function I showed you earlier Although it had a generic type signature, um, there is actually separate implementations that you have to use. So there's one in option, which is the option.mp, option being similar to maybe. Um, and there's also one in list. And depending on whether or not you're doing, sorry. Are they overloaded, like in SML? So can you import them all into the namespace and just use MP? And the type um, system figure as, yes, figures so out what you, yeah. okay. Um, but opening ML modules into the namespace can create other problems. Yeah. Uh, but yes. <coughs> um, so for the time being, um, there's work being done on improving this um, because the people that wrote and currently use um, OWEB are mostly ML programmers. So they haven't used things or they don't tend to reach for type classes in situations like this. Um, but there's work being done to actually start leveraging more of the type class superpowers and have these functions made a bit more generic. Um, yeah, OWEB applications, they're not very social. In order to talk to an external source or an external, um, or another web API or even another OWEB application, you actually have to utilize the FFI and either go out through, say, REST Angular on the front end to make a JavaScript request, or use as currently the standard, use the C API to use libcurl and make a request that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, which isn't really amazing for a web application framework, but... Um, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> that shows their... That's uh, how I would do it. 
it shows their dedication to keeping things uh, pure and contained within the language. Um, and as I said before, defining type classes is a little bit terrifying. Um, so now, I'm just going to dive into the demo. Example. Everyone see that? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is demo about to run. That's essentially the entire application. You know, so you can see you've got the HTML inline with normal code. There's no need to quote it or anything like that. Um, and we've got this is going to be a little FRP demo. Um, so we've created a source using just an empty string and then we're putting something on the source in the text box. So everything, every signal that's coming through the text box is going to be put onto that source and then we read off the signals just there and just do something with them. Let's see if I can make this right. Question, Sean. Yes. So the source and signal, is that actually part of some newfangled HTML goodness or is that something that Ur has defined? Um, it's something that OWEP has defined. Okay. Right. So as well as being, so you've got the, the valid, so it's more like a DSL, yeah. which is, yeah, HTML but with early bits. So that's just the basic uh, example. Uh, we've got another one, which is slightly more fun. I'm not sure if I put it in this folder or not. No, I didn't, because I'm clever. So this is a chat room application. Um, Adam recently gave a talk, or is going to give a talk at the um, I can't even, the POPL 2015 conference. I can't actually remember what the acronym stands for. You know? um, but his paper for that conference contains a chat room application. Um, so if you want to, if you want a fun project, you can work through the paper and build it up. So we just got our list of rooms. It's just This application is using um, the signal based, the signal and source, as well as using RPC and channels. Um, so every user in the chat room gets their own channel assigned to them, and then as messages are logged in the back end, the new set of messages gets, or well, the new messages get sent out to the channels for all the different users. And they put a listener just waiting there, and it'll just insert a new line. Can you just the code? Um, it's, I believe it's Comet using long uh, variation of long folder. Um, some of the files in here. So the .er files are the ones that actually contain the application source. Um, the .urs or .ers, that's sort of like a header file in C. 
So that's where you go and declare um, the types of particular functions. So chat room is the main main entry point of the application. So it's out of files pretty straightforward. This is the actual disk. disk. <laughs> okay. So there's a little uh, index or H G L. Okay. That's not related. Um. <laughs> HTML. Um. So we um. Is this application using a Postgres database or SQLite? Uh, Postgres. It's using Postgres. Right? Postgres is, is the default. Database. Yes. Um, oh, I forgot to mention when you declare your tables. Um, so here we've got one for room, message, and subscriber. Um, during compilation, when you add the right uh, string into the project file, um, the compiler will give you the SQL for creating the database. Um, so it takes care of all of that because it will actually namespace a lot of the tables. Um, and so when you're just coding along, you can just write up all of the different tables and where you need them and everything. And on compile, it will give you code to um, spin up the database, which is pretty handy. Uh, so what about migrations? <laughs> In what sense? So if you're going to change your program, add a new column, for example, to a table, um, currently it will just automatically migrate the database? As far as I know, it will just create a new SQL file for you, so migration is up to you. Okay. The date is not important. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just drop the table and create, <laughs> create one. Just drop the whole database. <laughs> it's fine. Um, That's cool. So, with SQL and, for example, just there, with SQL and HTML and normal code um, clicking around in a single source file, things can get a little manic. Um, but it's just busy. <laughs> Except it works. <laughs> um, but you can, because everything is just functions, you can just move the um, HTML up to separate modules if you want. Um, how many lines is the Is it all in the one file? No, it's not. There's oh, a, okay. a log module as well, which okay. handles actual the messages going in. So there's two modules? Yes. There's okay. the primary chat room one. So how many lines of code are there, approximately? I haven't checked. Probably okay. 100? Yeah. 150? It's pretty good. Uh, and of course, that includes all of the HTML for all of the pages and all of the JavaScript. Cool. Uh, I'm sorry if you explained this. What's a URS? Uh, the yep. URS is the file that contains, they're sort of like header files for C. Okay. Um, so they tend to contain the type definitions for what's going to be cleared, included in the ER file, which contains the actual implementation. Right. Um, they're not required. So if you don't include um, an ERS file, this particular like when you declare a module, you just need to declare a signature. And the yeah. signature is similar to this in that you'll have um, your different values or your different types that you've declared, and then just any of their signatures that go along with that. Yeah. Okay. But the general standard is to declare a NERS file as well, because it's sort of a nice, easy lookup for functions and things like that. So the ERS file is S for signature? And yeah. it's like your public? Your public interface in the model? Um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So you see it generates the JavaScript and splits the front end back in for you. You got any control over that? Like, you got sensitive information or things that you want to be on the server? Can you force that? Um, I don't believe so. Like validation, for example. Um, it would depend. It would depend largely where you put the code that does that. Um, so, for example, uh, a form post, um, the 
form post function itself is going to live on the server side, and it takes a record, which is the value, which is the identifiers of the fields that you've just submitted. Um, but if you were to use the sort of this this technique, and you did the validation in on clicks or things like that, or based on the signals, then it would be considered front end code. Um, so it's sort of it's part learning how the compiler breaks code up, um, but generally it is if you're in putting it into that HTML, it's going to push it onto the front. If it's stored in separate functions, it'll be pushed off to the back. When you have a look at generating JavaScript, like is it horrendous, or can you kind of understand what's going on? Um, it's 50-50. So for example, that's our own click function. Um, it's about as comprehensive as most JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's also like a, a runtime primary library, which is loaded. Um, it comes up pretty small too. So it's 53 kilobytes. Um, it sure tells me how much on them. Um, and the application executable, executable itself is quite tiny. So it's a few hundred kilobytes, depending on the application. Like you've got um, resources to compile those in as well, Resources like, uh, or CSS or, CSS or like that. Um, currently, it doesn't have. Uh, by design, it has no way of serving files explicitly. Yeah. Um, it can, does. You can use the URL allow system to basically let it provide files. But when you do things like, um, say, CSS, that actually becomes baked into the executable. Uh, which can be difficult to change later because you need to recompile the whole thing. Um, so mostly people run it as um, in its fast CG, what they call fast CGI server mode, uh, which is the AirWeb application sits behind something like Nginx or Apache, um, and it takes care of handling all the static files, and you simply bless the appropriate patterns in your AirWeb project file, and then it will safely load those, those files in. Um, there's a style type in the language as well. So if you wanted to start being nitpicky about your, the CSS styles that you use, you can do that too. Um, and it will actually be a compile failure if you attempt to use a style that you haven't declared. If you're feeling that <laughs> crazy. Anyone? With the FFI, Yes. Uh, do you have to make sure that your operations are item potent or provide a rollback um, to interact with the transactions nicely? That's generally the nice thing to do, but there's nothing to enforce it because it's just an FFI. Mm -hmm. um, the, C, the C API does give you um, some control over that in terms of the memory that gets allocated and things like that, mm. um, but it's yeah, I haven't tried to use it as yet. So. Uh, what's the kind of library or packaging situation? So if I want to write a web application and use persona authentication, and you know, is there a way for someone to write a, a library for that? And um, it already has a persona library implementation. Okay. Yep. Um, just as an example. Um, Currently, they're sort of spread everywhere in terms of actually finding packages. There's a yeah. few of the core ones listed on the actual web website, um, but generally, you'll find someone's written a project in web and they'll have a few modules which will be something that would be nice to be a library. Um, but so you have to talk to them about doing it. But yeah. mostly, there's no so there's no hackage for uh, there's no hackage. Yeah. Um, like the source for the language itself is stored in Mercurial. Um, but a lot of the projects are stored on GitHub, 
the library sort of give up some assorted material, so it's a little bit of a fun to see. How mature is it considered to be at this stage? Is it production ready? Uh, yeah, the people that use it consider it production ready. Uh, but obviously, they're a lot better at reading the typos. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are they using it for? Like, if, if this is running in production, what? Who's running it in production? What's it um, There's a web consulting firm in New Zealand that do um, applications in Java, Haskell, Urweb, PHP, and a couple of others. Um, there's the, I'm quite sure I don't pronounce it, the Bazquax um, reader, the RSS reader, um, is implemented in Urweb. Um, and that's the primary ones I know at the moment. Um, Adam has released a library for creating uh, people organizing websites, so for conferences or meetups or things like that. Yep. Um, so he says there's about a few hundred lines of uh, web code on top of um, the UPO library, which is what it's called. And you'll have your own sort of meetup organization website. That example is very cool. I would go digging into it if you're interested in this. The organization? Yeah, one. it's very yeah, cool. Sounds idea. good. Yeah. Like you could build, use it to build some sort of like mentorship program side or something. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So. Any questions? More? So it's not doing type providers for the SQL stuff, is it? Like you define what a table is, and then mm. it assumes that you're going to create the table with that code. Yes. Yeah. So when you're doing a query and you get a type error on the query, it's because it knows what the table is meant to be. Yes. It's not like a compile time going and having a look and. No, it doesn't. Yeah, no. Doesn't check at compile time. Sorry, because it provide it has everything that it, if your program is well typed, then the SQL file that's given you will produce that in combination with the application will produce a well typed application. Yeah. Um, but if you go in and fiddle with the SQL or anything like that, then kind of. That's rough. Yep. I've got more questions. So, um, <laughs> how easy is it uh, to, for example, um, read read headers, make decisions based on headers, um, dispatch to um, different implementations if there's different accept headers or different content types for what's being sent to you? Um, I've not encountered the header handling at the moment. Okay. I've seen the functions fly past when I was looking for other things. Um, but I would gather that you can do the required checking. Mm -hmm. um, it currently depends on OpenSSL, the language, like in order to compile the, uh, build the compiler, and that's what it uses for uh, crypto. Yep. Um, but apart from that, I think you just have to dig through the, the standard library, see what it offered. tied to x slash html or is it a viable option for APIs? Is that a way um, it does have a relatively untested, um, I think they've called it like a curl mode, um, so it's designed to be interacted with via the command line, um, but it's still not an applet, like it's still not an application or CLI application. It's essentially a web server responding to requests still, if that's what you meant. I don't think I've seen like web APIs. Um, just as a REST. REST APIs or something. Um, I don't know if it would make much sense given that it does I don't, I don't believe so. Um, it probably could do that in its little fast CGI mode. Um, so it would just depend on um, how it actually marshals and unmarshals the data. Because it's designed to be kind of handling all of that by itself. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how it would work. Maybe. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Sean. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so close. Um, in Sublime, we don't even have a syntax highlighting. Uh, what's the like the tool in Sublime? Um, um, there is an Emacs mode for it. Um, it's probably written before the language. <laughs> uh, the Emacs mode has some interesting quirks with respect to indentation um, that currently make it a bit painful to use, but it does have syntax highlighting and things like that. Um, I think there's a Vim mode as well. Um, I just open it up in Sublime because I normally use Acme for development, 
and it has no syntax highlighting. So I just opened Sublime because it could actually zoom. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> the subject of a different talk. <laughs> cool. Cool. Thanks, Sean.